downplay that word. So like, <laughs> I think to a large degree we're all kind of racist a little bit, right? And I don't, I don't mean that in a negative way or shape or form. To me, learning about racism and dealing with this world, I've understood that racism just means we don't understand. And people need labels. Society, this society that's been developed needs labels. And racist is just one of the words that they've used. I like to just destroy that word because to me that just means that we don't know about each other yet. That's where racism stems from. It's just plain, not ignorance, but that we don't know each other yet. That's really all it is. I had to learn all this myself too. And uh, there's a quote here uh, by a gentleman here that some of you may have heard of. And if you haven't, Google it. <laughs> Uh, part of the reason why I'm up here is to talk about uh, the camp, uh, to talk about uh, my heroes, and to talk about the lack of First Nations heroes that we see that I grew up with as well, or that I didn't grow up with, actually. Um, this quote here, and uh, this title here, um, Heroes, and my misconception of the warrior that I wanted to be is a key component to what it is that I'm doing now with the camp that's down there. And uh, just to quickly uh, summarize, uh, those of you that uh, can't see well enough to read this here, I'll uh, just put it. Who can actually read this? Can you all read this? Are there some of you that actually can't see it? No? Okay, good, right on. So this quote here I learned uh, probably in my mid-20s, actually. And I'm still trying to understand it. There's a lot of misconceptions that I was fed through media, through Hollywood, through society, through education. I grew up learning more about King Louis and Henry and all of those crazy, you know, SOVs out there in Europe, more than I learned about my own history and the own heroes that existed here on this, on, on Turtle Island, on the land that we all now live. Uh, this, excuse me, I'm, this is what I wanted to be. This is what I thought a man was for the longest time, was a fighter. And I look up to Francis Penamagabo here, an Ojibwe veteran here, and if you read some of his highlights here, a lot of people don't know who he is. There are films made about people that have done a lot of really amazing things, but to be blunt, they've done nothing compared to what this man has done for his own people. But we don't see these stories. I had to search in the archives, deep in the Google history and Wikipedia and all this stuff. And it wasn't until after he was died that I began to learn about him. The reason why I looked up to him is because 378 confirmed kills as a sniper. That to me was what I thought a warrior was, someone who fought, someone who took life, someone who protected. You know. To me that was the largest misconception that I've carried with me to this day. And the reason why I look up to Francis is because I believe that he may have had the same mentality growing up as well too, and that's why he joined the army. He volunteered for the army. After having gone to residential school, he didn't go for a full time, but he volunteered for the army after having gone to residential school, and I'm sure many of you know what happens in residential schools. But despite that, he chose to fight for Canada. Somewhere along the line, shortly after he enlisted, he became elected the chief of his nation, twice actually. He also served on the band council for a little while. And uh, as you can see at the bottom here, he was elected the supreme chief of the native independent government, the modern day assembly of First Nations. He created that. <clears throat> the warrior is not someone who fights for no one has the right to take another life. I believe Francis might have understood those things as well too, later on, after he had taken so many lives. And one of the things that propels me to do the work that I'm doing now, to be down there at the camp, is these simple things that I believe that we've really forgotten to do as men, as a community, as a people, as a society. I'm going to be blunt with you, and I'm going to be 100% honest with you from a First Nations perspective. This society that and I don't, I'm not pointing the finger at you when I say you, but you are all a part of it. This society that you are a part of, that has been created here, doesn't work for the individual. It doesn't. We understood that, and we still understand that. 
The residential school system was designed to provide, to, to turn us into white people because the common misconception was that we didn't know how to live. We didn't know how to take care of our kids. We were thought as savages. When the reality is, is that we actually know more about how to provide for a family, how to provide for a community, than I believe a lot of other nations and people on this planet. They forgot it. Our reality, let me, before I get into it, let me ask you a quick question. How many of you are immigrants? Are. Mm -hmm. right. How many of you identify as being Calgarians? How many of you identify as being Canadian? How many of you have ancestral roots that hold you to this island, this turtle island, for over 500 years? Over 10,000 years. Right? Those of you that don't have your hand up there, you are more than welcome to stay here. I want to make that clear. <laughs> But my personal theory of looking at everything that has been going on around this island, you look at what's happening down in Trump's America, you look at what's happening across Trudeau's Canada right now, and there is a lot, a lot of issues going on with the immigrant sectors, with the white sectors. It is not a lie, it is a fact that terrorists are white on this continent. They're not immigrants, they are white. And we have seen that. Now, I'm not saying this to make people feel bad. I'm not saying this to make white people feel bad. I want you guys to understand something, is that we know how to live. We never needed the residential schools. We never needed to be taught how to take care of our children. We knew that the pillar was respecting our women, was listening to our elders, and supporting each other Simply that. That's my hero. I didn't grow up in a house with alcohol. I didn't grow up in a house with drugs. My mom. Thank you. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky. I have a support system because my mom, my family knows how to take care of the people. My mom knows how to love. My mom went to residential school. Despite all of that, I grew up in a loving environment, free to be able to express myself, to expand my mind, to explore who I wanted to be. At an early age, she allowed me, like my sister back there as well, too, was also one of my heroes back there. She's a huge influence in my life. I went up to Edmonton a while ago, or, sorry, um, uh, not a while ago, like when I was 17. <laughs> but uh, I went up there, and this was two weeks before school was going to start. And uh, I was going into my grade 11 year, and I went up there to go babysit my niece at the time. She was, I think, two, fairly young. And I went up there to go help her. Well, uh, her husband at the time uh, was away at a business conference. And to summarize it, uh, she, we, she had picked me from the Greyhound. And on the way home, she said, hey, you should come live with us and go to school up here. And that decision kind of changed my life. And my mom understood that that was an opportunity for me to get away from the drugs and the alcoholism and the dysfunction that existed on the reserve that also was a part of our family. Not our home, but our broader family as well, too. So I was given the opportunity and allowed to explore and go off to Edmonton. Eventually, I lived in Toronto for 10 years as well, too. And that's a large reason why I'm back here doing what I'm doing is because of this woman and everything that she's done for me. Which leads me into the next part here. This is what I learned by being with her. A large, per a large, a large, Part of what I learned about how to be a man was by watching what not to do. My mom is the one who taught me how to be a man. My mom is the one who taught me how to be here, present. My mom is the reason why I am doing the work that I am doing here at the camp and for 
to get right down to it. The healing camp here, we originally started off as a protest to highlight the injustices of the Tina Fontaine and the Colton Grouchy trials that existed. That went on for about a week. And that was in support of a young woman in Winnipeg who set up the first camp in front of the legislature building out there on the day of Daniel Cormier's trial, or his acquittal. We set up out here in support of her. That went on for a week. In that week, I made a huge impact here in the city that I was completely shocked. Because I left to go to Toronto because of the racism I experienced here. And I came back, and I still see it. But what I also see is a huge amount of support from the non-native community that propelled me to re-raise the camp, to take down the protest signs, to not call it a protest camp, and to call it a healing camp. And to summarize and to go back to what it was that my mom and what it was that Sitting Bull had said, we know how to take care of our people. We know how to take care of our kids. We know how to take care of ourselves and be one with this land. And we have a lot to teach you when you're ready to learn. That's what it's about. And we understand that. This society doesn't think in terms of generations anymore. And that's what we do as First Nations. We think in terms of generations. But uh, the gentleman up here, I love what he said, but he said one thing that kind of made me think a little bit. And I don't want to con contest with him in any way, shape, or form. I really support what it was that he said. But when it comes to talking about the carbon taxes and uh, the pipelines and all that kind of stuff, and the society that we live in, and to save this society, to save what it is that we live in, it's not going to exist without the land. There is no society if we don't find a way to sustain the land. What I've been able to experience about the camp is a slew of people coming down from all different backgrounds. And the one question that I want to leave every one of you with is, how are you helping? And I don't mean like, how are you helping First Nations? I mean, just how are you helping anyone or anything? At the camp that we set up down there, we're going to be there right through the, right through, um, right through the, we're going to make it permanent. Long story short. <laughs> <laughs> We've been walking on eggshells for the last six months because what we were worried we were going to get kicked out. But honestly, we've had zero pressure from the police to have us removed. So, to summarize what we're going to do here, there are 400 churches here in Calgary. Over 400 churches. <coughs> Multiple synagogues, mosques, and temples for these other cultures, but nothing for the First Nations people to express and practice our own spirituality within our own traditional architectural structures. I would love it. In the next 20 years, maybe even 10, if we can work with the city to provide an area that is similar to a Chinatown or a Greek town or a little Italy yeah. for First Nations. Yeah. That's the summary of what that would be. For any of you that want to work, and we're just starting. We're just starting. I'm beginning to write the proposals and all this stuff right now. And there are a lot of like minded organizations that are doing the exact same work that we want to do, which is help the homeless help the youth, and really help provide a connection to our culture. That's really it. Those are the three components. And if there's any way any of you want to be a part of that, please let me know. We'd love to help you because we know that it's difficult to be an ally in these days. And I know that our responsibility as First Nations is to make this space safe for you to be able to engage in these conversations if you're afraid to ask these very stupid or ignorant questions that you may have. Because <laughs> let's be honest, sometimes we just don't know. And we don't know why it's offensive that people wear headdresses and those things, but we're here to learn from each other. So if you all want to learn, the camp is downtown in front of the courthouse, 6th Ave, 5th Street Southwest. <laughs> and just like our ancestors, you know, we invite you down to share all these ideas and see what we can do to make a better future for our children. I hope to see some of you guys down there at the camp. That's all I gotta say. I'm out of there.